Salve, homines et femine. Welcome to the great everything. Or today we might say, magnum omnium. Today is my favorite day in the year, a date I have celebrated since my earliest childhood. Wait, let me get my normal voice on. Because it's the 21st of April, and today in 753 BC, Rome, the eternal city, the head of the world, Caput Mundi, and the birthplace of Western society was founded almost 3,000 years ago. Think about that. 3,000 years and it's still there and it's still vital and it's glorious and oh, it's so beautiful. I've said this a thousand times and I'll say it again. Rome is the most beautiful place on earth. Yes, there's nature, there's grand canyons, there's national parks, there's tropical islands and waterfalls and caves, all amazing, all beautiful, all awe-inspiring. But if we're talking cities, if we're talking man-made beauty, there is no place on earth that is as breathtaking a testament to the very, very best that humanity can achieve. And if we're talking about our culture, Western civilization, it's also the most important city in the world. Sure, today New York and London have way more financial pull globally. Those two cities are where what happens in the world gets decided. And if by culture we mean what matters to kids today, what people are engaging with today, then of course Rome isn't as relevant. You got San Francisco, where all the tech is being made. You got Hollywood, where the films are. You've got New York and London where there's all these cool underground cultures coming out. There's always something exciting and new being born in these places. Rome doesn't have the urban culture you get there or even in Berlin or Paris. You won't find new global trends coming out of Rome. But our civilization, the structure of it, it all comes from there. Our language, our institutions, our infrastructure, our idea of what a society should look like, the richness of our history, the wonderful stories and literatures, and the sheer artistic beauty that you find in Rome is unparalleled. Did you know that Italy, a tiny nation, is the country with the most UNESCO World Heritage Sites? More than China, which is probably the closest contender to a country with the richest culture. Did you know that Italy has almost 50% of all of the world's artistic patrimony? That it has 5,500 monuments and museums deemed of historic importance? Compare that with France, 1,200. And I don't think anyone would argue that France isn't one of the most culturally rich places in the planet. So yeah, I love Rome. And not only because as a lover of art and food, Italy is one of the greatest places ever. Not just because I majored in Roman history and Latin and I love that stuff. Or is it because I lived 15 years in Italy and my mother and Ivano and my brothers, they all live in Rome. No, it's because Rome is central to my mission in life, which is sharing our culture with as many people as possible spreading an understanding for the great things in our civilization and history. Because I am worried about the lack of a sense of history that so many of our young people display. There's a lot that happened before World War II, you know. And progress is awesome. The things we can do now and where we can go in the future. But moving forward without understanding where we come from and how we got here, it's folly. It's like having no roots. It's bungee jumping without the rope. It's how we repeat all of our past mistakes. Look around you. So yes, if you cherish any aspect of our culture, or at least the good in it, please join me in wishing happy birthday to Rome, or Felix Natalis in Latin. There are cities more powerful, more fun, more influential, but none as beautiful and none as fundamental, literally, to the history of our Western culture. It was once a dream that was Rome. You could only whisper it, anything more than a whisper, and it would vanish. It was so fragile, and I fear that it will not survive the winter. Maximus, let us whisper now, together, you and I.
Hey guys, so what you heard there was a segment that I did a year ago on Anchor for the last anniversary of Rome's uh, founding. And I wanted to share it with you because it really does encapsulate much of what I think matters about Rome today, but also a lot of what resonates with me emotionally about this wonderful city that I now live in. Now, Rome does matter. We really need to engage with Rome. And I don't just mean as a city, although it truly is beautiful, and there are so many different sides to its beauty. There's ancient Rome with its wonderful ruins. There's medieval Rome with its eerie and fascinating catacombs. There's Renaissance Rome, of course, with its beautiful architecture and monuments and artwork like the Sistine Chapel. There's Baroque Rome. So many sides to its art and architecture and culture. But I'm talking about Rome not as a city, but as an idea, as the birthplace of, well, in many ways, the whole worldview that we have today in the West. And that's something that matters because we need to understand our past. If we want to move into a world to make it a better place in the future, we need to understand where we come from. We need to understand our origin story. And Rome in many ways is our origin story in the West. It matters. It is the birthplace of many of the ideas that make us who we are today. And so I want to celebrate today by looking at different perspectives on Rome and angles of its culture and history that live on today, its legacy, what it left us, what was its parting gift, what uh, is it about Rome that we carry with us in our culture, in our language, and in our institutions today? And to do that, I brought in two friends, two scholars and experts in ancient Rome. We had a three-way conversation on Rome's legacy, what it left us, why it matters, what it means to be Roman, and what we can take from that and use today. Also, I brought in another guest, an old guest who many of you from the old anchor will remember, Chef Patrizio, to talk about Rome's greatest accomplishment, Spaghetti alla Carbonara. But first, bedtime stories from ancient Rome. When I was a child, my father used to read me bedtime stories, and they were all from the histories of Rome by Livy, Aburbe Condita. Livy was the official historian of Augustus, just before the birth of Christ. And I was fascinated by these Romans, these men who seemed so filled with honor and nobility and courage and real pride in their nation, in their republic. This sense I had that Rome was a glorious thing, but it was more than just a republic. It was an idea. It was the idea that we are the pinnacle of human civilization and we will bring order into the world. We will impose sense and order and beauty over chaos. It was wonderful, this pride, it filled me with awe. And these heroes from Rome's infancy and the pages of Livy, they just jumped out at me and provided very early models for what a man should be. True to his convictions, noble, courageous, and believe in honor. One of these heroes was Muzio Scevola. In Rome's infancy, it overthrew the Etruscan kings that had dominated it, and the Etruscan civilization went to war with Rome, which was devastating for Rome because the Etruscans were so much more powerful. But Rome won anyway, thanks to these heroes, at least I thought so in my infantile mind, and one of them was Muzio Scevola, an assassin who attempted to kill the king of the Etruscans, Porsenna, but missed his chance. And captured and brought before the king, he put his own hand on the flame and let it burn, declaring, thus I punish the hand that failed the fatal blow. Wow, my child's mind was just blown away by this, by this courage, by this discipline, by this taking responsibility for one's own actions and failures. I loved it. I've always been a fan of discipline and this really forged my idea of what uh, the kind of man I wanted to be. Or Mario Torquato in the same war, a uh, general of Rome. And he gave the order to his troops 
not to attack the enemy. And one of his cavalry leaders was his son, young, brash, disobeyed the order and led a young team of cavalry over to fight the enemy. Totally annihilated the enemy, came back victorious. Amalia Torquato had him executed as an example that you should never ever disobey a Roman general. Those were the rules and the rules had been disobeyed. Now, I'm not expressing any sort of admiration for Manlio Torquato, but boy, did that sense of discipline and negation of one's own personal desires in the name of something greater, well, that really impacted me. Or it fucked me up, depending on whose side you're on. Next up in today's episode, an interview with two experts in ancient Rome, Tim and Brian, with whom at one point I spent four years locked in a room, but don't get too excited, it was just the classics library at the University of Edinburgh, where for four years we studied the ancient world and its history, and bonded over our shared passion for that world and the extraordinary individuals who inhabited it. We didn't just explore the ancient world and its culture and history through books, but also through shared adventures in search of ancient ruins in places like Romania and Croatia. So yeah, we've been around as a trio. We are very close friends. And it was exciting to bring them in to talk about Rome and its legacy and what it stands for and what the idea of Rome is and what its parting gift to our world was. Because this wasn't just a fascinating conversation about something that we love and that we believe matters to everyone but it was also our first conversation as a trio in over a decade. So I'm very pleased to, to share that with you. Tim is a PhD student and assistant lecturer at the Royal Holloway College in London. He uh, focuses on the transition between Rome as a republic and the Rome that we know of as the Roman Empire, a period that I think... Uh, merits close attention, particularly today, as we shift as a global culture away from liberal democracy into something that feels very close to autocracy, or at least authoritarianism. So that transition from a republic, something quite close to a democracy, to something that wasn't just quite close, but was synonymous with empire, the template for empire as we conceive it today, well, we should pay attention to that part of history. And if you want to uh, dig deeper into that in a way that is accessible and incredibly exciting and informative, I recommend Tom Holland's wonderful book, Rubicon, on that transition from Roman Republic to Roman Empire. Brian, another very close friend of mine, he lives in Georgia, just out of Atlanta, and he is uh, not just one of the greatest experts in Roman military history that I've met in my time at college, but a wonderful and talented artisan who recreates ancient tools and in particular drinking horns out of, well, horn. They are works of art that I cannot recommend highly enough that you seek out. Find his Facebook page, Where the Gods Live, and let me know if you disagree with me that his drinking horns are some of the most beautiful works of art you will see made in today's environment. So, without further ado, I bring you my friends, Tim and Brian. So, I think uh, that's all of us. All right, can you hear me? Yep. Oh my God, this is quite a momentous thing, isn't it? The three of us on a phone call. It's, it's right. gotta be over a decade now. Yeah since the three of us talked. Thank you so much for joining me here. This is quite an amazing little thing. There is a purpose behind all this. And that is, of course, the 21st of April being the, uh, the anniversary of the founding of Rome. It's also a date that I celebrate almost religiously every year as one of my main festivities. I live in Rome. 
Rome is uh, my favorite city in the world. I think it's the most beautiful city in the world for my taste. And also, of course, the three of us studied Roman history together during what was uh, certainly one of the highlights of my life. And uh, I know you guys have a deep connection to Rome, not just as a city, but as an idea to the point where, Tim, you're actually doing it full time now, studying Rome. So, yeah, it's my job. Exactly. So who better to get on the phone than uh, two of my closest friends? who are so knowledgeable and, uh, and as in love with Rome as I am, if not more. So if perhaps each of you could uh, introduce yourselves and then we can start talking about what Rome means to you, why you think it's important, why it matters, why people should care about Rome. Okay, uh, my name is Tim. I am a PhD student at Royal Holloway University London, and I work on Roman cultural history, uh, specifically the period of the transition from uh, Republic to Empire. I have been studying Rome on and off for a long time. Like Patrick, I have great affection for the city of Rome. I, I did live there briefly, and uh, I'm excited to have a chance to talk about Rome as an idea as and as a society and, and as a cultural force, although I do feel one of us ought to play the pedant and point out that the 21st of April is the traditional founding of Rome. We know, obviously, archaeologically, that Rome was occupied long before. Yeah, I wonder who that should be to play the pedant. Any takers? <laughs> <laughs> Brian, how about you? Uh, who the hell are you? <laughs> First of all, it's nice to see that uh, old habits die hard, and uh, <laughs> we're going to fall right back into the old roles one more time. Uh, so my name is Brian. I live in Atlanta, Georgia now. I work for myself, but I did a uh, an MA honors in ancient history and classical archaeology with uh, Tim and Patrick many, many moons ago. And I also did an MSc in classics. And in specific, uh, I studied recruitment in the Roman auxilia from major Roman provinces during the imperial period. So would you like uh, to just briefly explain what auxilia means? Sure. I mean, they were the, uh, let's call them the adjunct forces, the, the auxiliary forces to the Roman legions, which were comprised primarily of uh, non-citizen soldiers serving in the Roman army. Yeah, what we'd call barbarians today. <laughs> uh, yeah, actually, that's a relatively uh, accurate word, especially the way the Romans themselves probably would have felt about most of them. Right. So what I do want to kick it off with is to say that to me, Rome is it really is more than a city. It's more than an interesting civilization in our past. I see Rome as being the high point, the culmination and maybe the completion of a whole set of experiences in history and culture that is the ancient world. Within that narrative, I wanted to ask you guys what you think the role of Rome is in our culture, in our history, in our society. Why should people today give a shit? You want to start, Tim? Ooh, uh, I should be able to express this in a couple of sentences. I think that you can see in Rome, I think, the origins of fairly fundamental ideas they remain fundamental to, to Western society. Things like the way the Romans thought about, say, for example, the relationship between the citizen and the state. It's very formative in the way the West thinks about that. So much of Western literature comes out of stuff either the Romans generated or the stuff that they transmitted to us from the Greeks. The concept, and I'm, again, I'm not suggesting that the Romans either invented this, but it's transmitted through them. So the concept of rule of law, for example, now you can argue that that was never applied properly in Rome, and you could argue it's not applied properly today. The idea that the government is of the people, I mean, the Romans give us the word republic, right, which just means the people's thing, the people's concern, the public concern. These seem obvious, but through most of Western history, these, these things are not obvious. These things are not the norm. I should stress, uh, I'm talking about, about the, the Republic, obviously the relationship between citizen and state, yes, um, yes, yes, or yes, subject and state changes when it becomes an empire. It's not worth getting into the, into the scholarly debates about exactly how much input or, or interest the average Roman citizen, um, and by which, of course, I should stress that that means freeborn Roman male. Um, had in the government how often they voted when they bothered to turn up voted. The system is definitely stacked against the common man in favour of the rich. But there is a definite sense that Roman citizens thought they had some sort of voice, some sort of interest. And you see this at the beginning of uh, uh, the Principate. Uh, you see occasions when there's tension in the Roman system because Roman citizens still believe they have some sort of right to be involved in the decision making of the state to, and to profit from the, the state's activities. And of Despite the fact that there's basically a god emperor uh, sitting on a throne somewhere. Yes, uh, yes, quite so. I mean, uh, there are other 
periods. Athens, obviously, is another period where citizens feel they have some sort of influence, some sort of, and should get some sort of benefit from the way the state works. But it's that relationship between citizen and, and state, the rights of the citizens, that, that I find so interesting. And I think um, it is, again, something that just wasn't the case in most of Western history. Your average French peasant or, or merchant in 1750 didn't think about his relationship with the state the same way. And I think that you don't get more modern thought like that, except for the fact that in the Enlightenment, you know, everyone's reading yes. Cicero and Tacitus and, and Sallust and the other Romans who, who think about this relationship. That's a really interesting perspective. And you're right. We can actually argue whether your average Roman citizen did have a voice, the extent to which that voice was heard and, and was relevant. But the fact is that at least as an idea, we know that that was a concept that mattered to the Roman. Mm. The idea, whether it was uh, it worked in practice or not, that he had a voice. And we can see that in Roman mythology, or rather mythology of Rome, in stories like in Livy, who t- tells about the story when the plebeians decided to get their rights and they went off onto the mountain. And so the people, effectively, they bugger off onto a mountain and they say, well, you know what? If we don't get a vote, if we don't get a consul, which is basically the uh, Roman equivalent of a president of the United States, except there were two instead of one because, you know, checks and balances, etc. If we don't get one place at the highest position in the table, we aren't going to be part of your society. And the patricians, the, the aristocrats, they gave in, they accepted. Now, was that a historical fact? Did that actually happen? We don't know. But we do know that it was important enough as an idea to the Romans to have it as part of their mythos. Yeah, I think that's a really important point that it's not just, and again, this is perhaps a different difference between Rome and the Enlightenment, it's not just the elites that are thinking about this relationship. And that's the, the plebeian secessions are obviously mythological and probably didn't happen or, or you know, the, the jury's out on that. But, but there are historical events, more or less concrete, as concrete as ancient history gets that demonstrate that average Romans, in fact, poor Romans, the sort of poor well Romans going into the army, are still concerned about their rights, their relationship with power, their relationship with the Senate or their general or whoever it happens to be. So it's not purely a foundational myth. It clearly was part of Republican culture. And, and it's no uh, coincidence then that the beginning of our part of emancipation from what ultimately ended up being a thousand year theocracy with the church in, in medieval Europe, that the beginnings of that emancipation were with intellectuals and artists discovering the written works and the sculptures of the ancient Romans and the Greeks and understanding that there were different ways of doing this, different ways of conceiving the individual's position within the world, including in relation to the state. And it's also no coincidence that modern democracies, you know, the, the ones that sprang out of the Enlightenment, like the United States and the French uh, and the French Revolution, they so openly mimic Republican ideals and architecture. Brian, do you have any input on that? What do you feel when you think Rome? Okay, so I'm going to kind of, I don't know, I'll probably touch on a few things that you guys have already talked about, and then maybe add a little bit more to the conversation as well. I, I live in the U.S. I live in a republic, which is the enlightened thinkers, so to speak, of the 1700s uh, were intentionally basing it upon a governmental model that was idealistic to them that came from Rome. <laughs> they weren't basing it on a governmental system in England or in France or anywhere else like it at the time. They were shooting for idealism, and their idealistic, their idealistic idea there was Rome, which is part of the reason that so much of the American symbolism, uh, the eagle. That's why we chose the eagle as our symbol as opposed to an animal that, that's not in other countries. Um, you know, why we didn't choose a turkey or <laughs> a grizzly bear or whatever. You know, we, we, we chose the same symbol as Rome. So anyway, yeah, we live in a republic. Uh, hell, Patrick lives in a republic. You know, I mean, the parliamentary system has got a lot of its roots in the ideas of the Roman Republic as well. You know, there are bits and pieces here. I mean, I, I think I could, you could maybe make a case that even the idea of, say, the, you know, the king's relationship to parliament, if we go back as far as the Magna Carta, the idea that there is a, a elected body and a nominated body that has power next to an absolute monarch or a, even a constitutional monarch, those ideas are born a lot of, in a lot of cases out of the Roman Empire. Beyond that, in a cultural sense, you know, Rome did two huge things to me. Um, one, it drew a lot of the map of the Western world. The idea that England, that, that the UK is a country, 
is is a separate country in and of itself was really created by Rome. Um, the idea that that Gaul, which is you know suspiciously close to modern France's borders, the idea that that was all one place with three different provinces with again Rome, Iberia, so on and so forth. So I mean, Rome drew a map of Europe and created a lot of the borders that have become humongously influential over the last thousand years. And through those ideas, so many of the Western empires have their roots in Rome. There's this idea that I had expressed that Rome is the birthplace of Western civilization with, you know, capital W, capital C. The idea of it actually being a civilization as opposed to just a collection of, you know, of Thebes and Athens and, you know, some Etruscan doing this. And then it's the actual birthplace of the West. Yes. Um, the, and you actually touched on what I was going to say a second ago uh, that you made me remember. Rome also helped establish the idea of a state at all. There's, I mean, there's, there's going to be a million arguments, but I mean, and, and I mean this, of course, in the Western context, because Chinese have been doing their thing for, for a damn millennia at this point. But the idea that there is an entity that is larger than the city in which you live. Of course, the Greeks talk about Greece. They talk about Hellas, but it's a very nebulous concept to them. It's a very, you know, they're Athenian more than they are Greek. And the same thing is true. I mean, you know, I mean, that's the same problem they have with Alexander. You know, who maybe lives in greater Greece, but he's Macedonian. He's not really Greek as far as the Greeks themselves are concerned until, of course, it becomes politically convenient or mythologically convenient later to make him more Greek. You know, I live in a country that's land-wise enormous. There are 50 states, which are effectively 50 countries, but we have this one greater unifying narrative. And I feel like in a lot of ways that Rome helped create the idea of a greater narrative. Now, the degree to which your average citizen in Britannia or in Pannonia felt like they were Roman or whatever city they're from. I can't really answer. I don't know. But I feel like it helped create this narrative of the, there's an overarching concept as opposed to just this tiny corner you live in. Yeah, I think I think that's really important. It, it also leads into the, the other important thing about Rome from a sort of a long history sort of standpoint. Unlike most historical states it is a cosmopolitan and a and a most multi-ethnic state where people from different countries of different ethnicities speaking different languages or to a lesser or greater degree see themselves as roman but when you think about all the great roman authors i can think of two julius caesar and uh, the poet uh, horace uh, are from the city of rome Many other ones are from the Italian provinces. Some of the some of the greatest ones, uh, uh, Tacitus, for example, is is from Gaul. Uh, Virgil's from North Italy. He's not. Yeah. Virgil's from North Italy. So is Livy. Yet they are uh, all Roman. They're all Roman, and they all to 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 some degree identify as Roman. And I think Brian's point about the United States um, is probably a useful way of thinking about it. Uh, Brian, I imagine you identify both as an American and a Georgian. Quite right. Yeah, there's layers of identity, and that, and it's sort of the over umbrella being the United States, and in their case, the over umbrella being the, a Roman. This what what of... does that mean, though? What does it mean to be Roman? You know, when we say uh, what it means to be American, we have a very clear idea in mind. It depends on whether you like America or you don't like America. So, if you're an anti-American Frenchman, you'll probably say it means to be arrogant and to uh, to eat bad food and go around in shorts all day. But if you're, you know, someone who's more sympathetic to the ideas of what America stands for, you have an idea of what it means. Like, I am an American. In a similar vein, what does it mean to be a Roman man? Uh, what is the what is the version of being Roman that speaks to you? Uh, oh, um, probably probably Cicero, I should think. I knew you were going to say that. I knew they said Cato. If you're trying to be difficult, you would have gone for Cato the other <laughs> <laughs> Quite so, yeah, I nearly did. Can you briefly tell people why you love Cicero so much? Well, Cicero is, is a really interesting figure because he's sort of not of the elite he's from a, a wealthy but not but not wealthy by the standards of the roman aristocracy um provincial family so he has this bizarre thing where he, one of the things he celebrates about rome is the idea that when you if you're very good and very clever and you work very hard and you serve the state properly you can succeed and yet at the same time he's very uncomfortable with people that aren't most aristocratic of aristocrats being in power I mean, terrified of the common man but, uh, but, but I think Cicero, uh, the, the, the big things would be 
the idea that there should be some merit involved in, in, in who's in charge and it shouldn't be based on birth. And most importantly, and I think this is the foundation of what I would, in my own subjective way, call good civilization, he, he recognizes that in Rome, everyone is subject to the same law. I think that, that he certainly would throw out terms that sounded familiar to modern Americans or Europeans. He talks about liberty a lot. He's very concerned that he'd be able to say what he likes without repercussions. Obviously, he was wrong about that, but, but he certainly believed that was how it worked in the Republic, he, and that's how it should have worked. He was terrified of the idea of one man becoming too powerful. And then, there's, and then obviously, the more cultural stuff, a sort of sober-minded, um, dignified restrained outlook on life, which comes partly from his stoicism and partly from Roman traditions. What about you, Brian? I think one of the big ones that resonates with me, and this is me probably projecting onto history more than it's maybe reality of history, but um, what the Enlightenment took up, which is the Roman, especially uh, the Republican Roman and the early empire, you know, it, they at least gave the appearances that they strove for reason. <laughs> there were tons of illogical ideas, but they were constantly striving forward with their with their logic as well. I mean, whether it was philosophy, um, you know, someone like Seneca or uh, Marcus Aurelius, or whether they were, you know, striving forward in terms of their uh, engineering feats and their their technological advances. Their, you know, they were just they were striving to, from looking at them as though they're a story, as a mythology. They seem to be continually striving to make the world a better place for Romans. You know, now I realize that, that, that you know, a lot of these concepts got really – are very problematic because of the age of imperialism and everything else. But, you know, if we take it as an ideal rather than with all of its other historical complications, that's kind of the part about being Roman that speaks to me. That is a very similar to the answer I'd probably give to that. I mean, I sometimes walk around – Rome. Yesterday I went to pick up a friend of mine who came to visit from London and I was driving her to her hotel uh, from the airport and uh, I drove past the Arch of Constantine and then made a right and as I was driving we came across the Colosseum and I was filled as I always am every time I see it. I can't help but just being overwhelmed and not just because it is beautiful, it is it, the structure of it, the engineering of it, the fact that it has stood for 2,000 years. But I'm, I'm struck by the idea of who were these people who would think of making such a thing and who could pull it off in a way that not only it stood for such a long time in such a, well, frankly, phenomenal condition, considering, but also that that had a social purpose. There are countless examples of this that you get walking around Rome that you'll just see something still standing there and it's awesome and it's big and it works, you know, the Pantheon. And it's just so cleverly devised. And you're wondering who were these people that could come up with this, that could come up with the idea, with the engineering, with the manpower, with the will to do such a thing. And I don't think I've ever encountered in my studies of history any other people that have been so conscious and so systematic in their desire to move beyond their borders and impose order and structure on the world. And you have individuals like this in ancient Greece. You have the first philosophers who are stepping outside and they are also consciously trying to impose order on chaos through their thought, through structuring the world into uh, you know an ordered philosophy but they are individuals i've never seen this done in the same way and to the same extent as a people as i've seen it done by the romans i think i i feel i must push back a little bit on your characterization of the of the motivations of rome i think that certainly having conquered somewhere the romans felt a very strong desire to to impose order because order allows the collection of taxes and trade and and um, and I, I think that you're you're right to say that the Romans have this drive for order in the parts of the world they control, but I don't think that it was a desire for uh, Rome didn't conquer the Mediterranean to to civilize it. Rome conquered the Mediterranean because it went to war with someone to beat them. 
Uh, I agree. With, I agree with that. Let me just uh, clarify one thing. When I said to step beyond the borders to impose order, I don't mean stepping beyond the geographical borders of, of, of Rome, of the empire. I was speaking more metaphorically in the sense of the idea that there is something out there that needs to be ordered, something stepping out of one's own borders, rather. I do not think that there was some uh, Star Trek Borg-like design to to create an <laughs> ordered world that should all be within their dominion. No, I think it's more a case of someone gets elected and they think, well, uh, I could do with making some money, so I need a war. <laughs> they conquer places and, and then they think, well, if we're going to run it. We might as well run it. That well. is a, that, that's a fair pushback. I, um, I accept that. It doesn't, uh, it does nothing to change my grand narrative, though, of uh, my idealized vision <laughs> of, of the Romans as, uh, as fearless conquerors of the unknown in a world of chaos. Patrick, I've never said anything to uh, you yes, that's you managed have, to change yes, it in the way you thought you, about you, the world. You, made so. me, you <laughs> insisted that I watch many great comedies that I didn't want to watch. <laughs> the only thing I wanted to add to this, if I'm thinking like in a, in a grand metaphorical sense, that uh, sort of Rome's parting gift to the world, so to speak. And it's not just Rome's gift, to be fair. It's Rome and Greece's gift as well. But I, I would argue that a lot of it was preserved. Even the Greek knowledge was preserved because of the Romans. But uh, ultimately, the Renaissance and the Enlightenment. If Michelangelo isn't there the day that the, the Laocon is dug up next to the Colosseum, does he ever sculpt the David? Does he ever sculpt any of the, his amazing works if he doesn't see where the boundaries are and how to push past those boundaries? So much of Western thought, so much of the Enlightenment and even the Renaissance is really due to Roman writings um, and Greek writings being re-exposed to Europe after the fall of Constantinople and the Byzantine Empire, and all this knowledge floods Europe as it's fleeing the Ottoman Turks. And in a lot of ways, I see that as like the, the final gift, uh, not of the, the Roman sword and not of the Roman uh, system of government per se, but more just of the, the better parts of what we're all striving for in any culture, which is our art, our, architect, you know, our, our architecture, our, our enlightened thinking, so to speak. That's, you know, that was kind of Rome's parting gift to the Western world. That's that's exactly true. I think I think by the same standards, uh, Machiavelli doesn't write about governance the way he does in a sort of a clear-minded, practical way, without talking about bloodlines or God. If he's not reading Livy and and Plutarch and, and Castus, you know, or, I mean, do we get do we get Voltaire? Do we get you know? Uh, I mean, how many of these the modern uh, uh, do we get Descartes if we don't have Socrates? I don't think fact. Thomas Jefferson. Uh, that's an absolute fact. fact. Um, and I think that's Rome's – and I, for me, I think that that's maybe the thing that I'm singularly most in awe of is that this, this, you know, this people gave uh, this amazing parting gift to the Western world. That's, ultimately, that's their legacy to me. Guys, any parting remarks on, uh, on Rome on its birthday? Uh, I have one question. Okay. Uh, you said you celebrate Rome every year, but you never told anybody what the celebration actually involves. Like how do you, how do you celebrate the birth of Rome every year? What, is it, what do you do? I eat carbonara. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so you don't you don't purchase four pairs of gladiators and make them fight to I, death in, no, in I, your but, uh, but I car park? Uh, I do watch sex scenes from the Spartacus uh, TV series. <laughs> <laughs> There's nobody nobody can throw off the tarpian rock anymore, huh? <laughs> None, uh, none of that. But no, so, um, no. But it, I spend the day in a way that is my own little personal tribute to Rome. So, for instance, I'll be doing a bunch of different things. I might go to the forum. I might do – on Saturday, one thing that I know I'm doing, I'm taking my friend uh, who came to visit me to eat at Costanza, you know, the place I took Hugh Brian with Rene that time. Oh, yeah. Visit. And that is a, a restaurant that is, uh, well, in the ruins of Pompey Theatre, and it's Roman cuisine. And I think it's actually quite apt because I get to celebrate the founding of Rome. Uh, sitting within the foundations of Rome, in a sense. So, yeah, but that kind of thing. It's small. It's not like I don't throw a big party or anything, but it is a day where a lot of time is spent thinking about and, uh, and paying my own personal tribute to Rome, which is a city that means a lot to me, not only because of uh, a wonderful history. You know, my bedtime stories when I was a child were from Livy, my father. That's what he used to read me. And to me, these stories were the equivalent of what the Bible stories must be for someone who is deeply religious. And it's more than a story if you live in Rome and you can see the signs of where these great people once stepped in everything in our civilization, from our language to our culture, to our infrastructure, to the way we think about the state. People need a mythology. 
we need a story. You know, it's part of the foundations of how we are, who we are. It's a building block of of being a person. And so we all need mythology. And you know, for for Rome, for you, um, Rome provides a lot of that mythology. It really does. Well, thank you guys. I'd like to express my gratitude oh, for joining me. And have, so much fun, guys. Yeah, yeah, so much. Take care, buddies. Speak soon. The Great Everything is brought to you by PASTA! Ciao a tutti! My name is Chef Patrizio and today I will teach you how to make the most famous Roman dish, spaghetti alla carbonara, or as they say in English, carbonara. So, I eat many times carbonara in England and in uh, US of A, and every time I think, fucking hell, this is disgusting, you have no idea what you are doing, uh, like uh, 13 year olds trying to fuck, you put crazy things in the past, egg white, ham, mushrooms, cream, what the fuck, not today, not on my watch, here is original Roman recipe for spaghetti alla carbonara, you're welcome. Now, two things you need to know about carbonara. Uno, authentic carbonara, like all Italian cuisine, is very, very simple. Recipe is easy. The difficult part is timing. Carbonara has to be served quickly. No leave a settling plate. Carbonara is like comedy. Timing is everything. Due, carbonara has three components. Pasta, sauce, meat. And you need the right ingredient. Ok, iniziamo, let's get started. First thing, pasta. Spaghetti is good. Or you can try penne or my favorite, rigatoni. Short pasta with the hole so the meat can go inside, yes? Important, always dry pasta. No tagliatelle, no fettuccine, no egg pasta bullshit. You already have egg in recipe, what the fuck you need egg pasta for? Two, sauce. You need three things, egg yolk, no white, only yolk, black pepper, and cheese. Pecorino Romano, if you can't find, then okay parmigiano, parmesan, but it's not authentic. That's it, egg yolk, black pepper, cheese, no cream, no mushroom, no peas, no bullshit. 3. Meat. The only option is guanciale, pig cheek. No pancetta, no bacon, pig cheek, guanciale. Only use pancetta if your only child is about to die and last wish is emergency carbonara and Italian story is too far away. Now, okay, prima di tutto, first of all, you put pasta on the boil. No American style. First you boil the water, then you put the pasta. And a bit of salt, not too much. Pasta must be al dente. No disgusting soft pasta tastes like Japanese udon noodle. Al dente. Roman eat pasta hard. Now, while pasta cook, the sauce. Take bowl, ceramic. Two big egg yolk per person. You beat the egg yolk with a fork and lots of fresh pepe nero, black pepper, and a bit of pecorino cheese. You make it become like cream, no? Fatto, that's it, that's your sauce. Put aside. Meat now. You fry the guanciale with a bit of oil. If your child is dying and you're using pancetta, you give it flavor with a bit of black pepper and use some white wine vinegar to while you fry, you know? Just a bit shh, like that. You make evaporate while fry. You do this very last thing. You start cooking the meat when the pasta is almost ready. So the meat is hot when the pasta is ready. Two minutes before is quick. Tip of the trade, if you use guanciale, you cook very, very, very high heat, so outside of guanciale become crispy and inside the fat melt, it become like bacon confit. Now timing, when pasta is done, you take it off the flame, you drain the water, but keep tiny bit of water, and immediately you throw in the guanciale with the fat. Mescola, you stir well, Remove from cooking pot and put in a bowl with the sauce. And you stir quickly and now you serve immediately on plate. Because if you leave too long, heat from pasta, it cook the egg and it become pasta with scrambled egg. It's ridiculous, it's carbonara, it's no breakfast dish. Now, you add the black pepper and pecorino cheese. Finito, e fatto. You have with a glass of red wine, Montepulciano d'Abruzzo, ed ecco fatto. This is recipe for authentic Roman carbonara. Buon appetito!
Ladies, gentlemen, thank you for listening to today's episode of The Great Everything, and I hope you enjoyed it. Now, if you want to be a part of the conversation, there's a few different ways you can do that. If you're listening on Anchor, you can call in and we can have conversations. You can ask questions and I'll be happy to include your call and your questions on the next episode. And we can discuss live. Or you can join the Facebook group, The Great Everything. It's a link to The Great Everything on Facebook. And it's just a group of a few friends. And we have discussions about, well, literally everything, as long as we do so respectfully and in a way that is interesting and stimulates conversation. That's what we're all about, interesting conversations. So if you want to be a part of those conversations, please check out The Great Everything, the group on uh, Facebook. If you like what I do here, please help out. And the best way you can do that, that is also free of charge to you, is by leaving a review on iTunes or wherever else it is you listen to The Great Everything. If you're listening on a platform where you can leave a review, please do that. It is very, very helpful and I'd be extremely grateful. Also, consider adding me on social media. There's the usual places, Twitter, Instagram, etc, etc. But you can find all these handles grouped together on the blog thegreateverything.com, where you'll also find interesting articles by myself and my friend Mark, with whom I started the blog. I hope you enjoyed everything and you continue to do so in the future. I am sure I will as well. Arrivederci. podcast you just heard was recorded with anchor if you want to make your own download the android or ios app completely free from anchor.fm slash podcast that's anchor.fm slash podcast